Thank you, Arvid, Ronnie, and Josephine for what an inspiration. God uses us in so many different ways to share the love that he has embedded in us all. So please turn to Matthew chapter 28. Our scripture reading today will be from verses 16 through 20. And let us listen to what God, what Christ is saying to us in his own words as he articulates the great commission to us as his disciples. Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of age. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day that we can worship you and glorify you through the teachings of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Speak to us and speak through us and help us to recognize our calling to do your kingdom's work in passing the legacy of our faith in Christ Jesus. In his precious name we pray. Amen. Doug Cherry, in his book titled Stick It, described the relay as a fascinating thing and in some ways, rivaled by no other sporting event. In fact, if you haven't read the book as yet, it's only 148 pages, and I would strongly encourage you to do so. But Doug described the relay as beautiful. Beautiful when it works. Ugly when it does not. You see, the amazing thing about a relay race, it does not matter how excellent you are or how talented you are or how well you might have trained or just how plain fast the team is. Unless the baton is in the hand of the man or the woman who finishes the anchor leg and crosses the finish line, there is no victory. See, the amazing thing about the relay race, it does not matter how how excellent you are. It does not. And if by any chance the baton is dropped and the team is disqualified, there is no victory lap, there are no flowers, there are no trophies, There are no medals, and definitely there is no glory. Any flaw can slow down the process, and hundreds of seconds can be lost. Let me take you back to 2008 Olympics in Beijing. The United States 4 by 100 relay team was poised, and they were expected expected to win the gold medal. Silver or bronze was not even an option for that team. After all, they had the fastest team and supposedly the fastest man anchoring the final leg. There was no one faster than Tyson Gay in the world in 2008 in that event. Unfortunately, they Women 4x100 relay team did not perform any better either. And as it turned out, it was the first time since the 4x100 relay team our race was introduced to the Olympics, the United States 
failed to win a medal in that event. They failed to win a medal in that event. Why? Why did they fail? Because of failed baton passes. Friends, the baton provides a perfect illustration of our heavenly calling in our lives as parents, as grandparents, as uncles and aunts, and as followers of Christ Jesus. God has entrusted to us a baton, and it is, it is the legacy of our faith. And the legacy that we leave has the potential to impact this world forever through the lives of our descendants and the generations that we pass the baton on to. The legacy of the Hebrew nation actually began when God called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldeans. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, The Lord said to Abraham, Leave your country, your people, your father's household, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and I will be, you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the people on earth will be blessed through you. Well, I was so fascinated. Why did God went to Ur to call someone out to create this great nation of Israel? And I had to go back, and I had to look, do some research about this place, Ur. You know, I found out that Ur was a very advanced place, and that could be compared to a modern city, having libraries and schools and maybe a system of law. It was a rich and elaborate city. But God did not... Abraham did not turn to God and say, wait a minute, God, are you kidding me or what? What are you saying? Are you, you kidding me? You think, how do you think I'm going to go to Sarai and tell her, well, I'm going. I don't know where I'm going. I'm going. If I tell Shireen that, she's going to get me out of the door. Are you kidding me? Abraham did not say to God, God, what am I going to do with all this stuff that I have accumulated in 75 years. By the way, you said I'm going to be a father of a great nation. Guess what? I don't even have a kid. How is that going to happen? Come on, God. Are you kidding me? But Abraham, what did he do instead? He believed God and by faith listened and followed God's instructions. Hebrew 11, 8, by faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. You see, Abraham trusted God, and he believed in the promises. When God promised us something, he always delivers on his promises. God never fails to deliver on his promises. There is no question about God's blessing upon the Jewish nation today. But unfortunately, that blessing fell short when the Jews failed to accept the baton that was passed on to them, and they failed to accept Christ Jesus as the Messiah and the Lord and our Lord and Savior. Instead, what did they do? They arrested him. They mocked him. They spat on him. And if that's what, not, not enough, they took him to a cross and nailed him and left him to die. Friends, it's a shame to know how much blessings the Jewish nation is losing out on today because they dropped the baton and they failed to accept Christ as the Messiah. They failed to accept Christ as our Lord and Savior.
Mahatma Gandhi, who was one of the most influential people in India, a country with over 1.25 billion people, not millions, billion people, was deeply hurt by his experience with apartheid and Christians during his stay in South Africa. And he was shrewd enough to tell missionaries, he said, I like your Christ. However, I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so much unlike your Christ. When asked, why didn't you embrace Christianity, Gandhi? He said it offered nothing that he could not get from his own religion. To be a good Hindu also means that I would be a good Christian. There's no need for me to join your creed to be a believer in the beauty and teachings of Christ Jesus or to try his, to be his, his followers. Because... Your Christians are not like your Christ. Friends, can you imagine what the Christian faith could have been like today had Gandhi seen Christians as he saw Christ? You see, the legacy that we leave has the potentials to impact the world forever. God has called us to take the best that he's delivered into our lives and, and hand it to the next runner, who must hand it to the next and the next and so forth. God has established his kingdom right here on earth as a relay race and a successful baton pass is our highest calling as servants of God. We are living in a world today where the successful baton passing is more important and at the same time more difficult than any time in the history of the church. Things are a lot, a lot tougher today for Christians. Our society is against us. Thing, it's, it's, it's really tough for Christians today. Look at what's happening in Iraq. Or look what's happening in, in, in Syria or in Sudan. Look at what ISIS and Al-Qaeda are doing. You know, they're saying, well, we are attacking. It's, it's, a, it's about the West. It's about America. It's about Europe. No. It's about their attacks on Christianity. That's what it is about. It's not about the West. It's about their attacks on Christianity. And what can we do about it? What can we do about it, Arvid? As a believer and follower of Jesus Christ, I am called. Bill Hook, you are called. Dave, you are called. Arvid, Ranny, Josephine, you are called. Deacons, greeters, ushers, Sunday school teachers, youths, child care providers. Visitors, if you're here today, you are called. We are all called. Yes, we are. You see, we are all in this relay together, and we're all called to pass the baton of our faith, which is in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We are all called to do God's kingdom work right here on earth. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. The Apostle Paul talked about how the baton was passed from Timothy's grandmother to his mother and then to Timothy. Verse 5 reads, When I call to rem remembrance the unfailed fate that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. You see, we all have a mandate to reach a lost and dying world. We do. And each of us has an individual personal calling and assignment to pass that baton on to the next person, pass that on to the next runner, and carry on the legacy of our faith in Christ Jesus. 
You see, this is not about saying, well, you know, I am better than you, or you are better than him or her. You see, we are all in this race together, and we are all on God's team. And we should all be encouraging and praying for each other. You know, I know we all been in this for the past couple of months. We feel like downtown has been going a little, it's a little bit unstable. We don't have a pastor. Well, let us not have a pity party and say, well, we don't even have a pastor in our church today. Well, I'm just going to sit back and I'm going to lay back. I'm going to chill out a little bit until the new pastor comes in. And then let's see where, where he's going to take us and how he's going to take us to the promised land. No. See, God has given us all special gifts to reach out and touch lives. Let us seek his guidance and contribute to the everyday life of the church of Christ. Touching lives by exercising the fruits of the Holy Spirit. God has enormed us within the, with a shield of protection. Let us go out into the world and demonstrate his love through us. Making disciples and baptizing them in his name. And it can start right here. Right here at Downtown Baptist Church. Mother Teresa, who was born in Yugoslavia, she found her calling to leave her rich, middle-class lifestyle and go into the slums of Calcutta to, to care for the poorest of the poor, making disciples of others. And in her words, she said, I heard the call to give up and follow Christ into the slums to serve him among the poorest of the poor. You see, without a question, we have an abiding, penetrating awareness that the highest calling upon our lives is to pass that baton of our Christian legacy. We must make that investment and perpetuate the truth of God's word, the power of his presence, and the calling to serve him. So when our days on this earth are completed, our children, our loved ones, our friends, the lost sheep, will have successfully received what God has handed to us. And if we make the handoff, they can run. And if they run, Bill, God's people can win this race. And God will be at the finish line saying, well done, good and faithful servants. Enter into your rest. But here's the warning. It is not going to be easy. It is not going to be easy. Satan has crafted a whole new strategy to fight the spiritual war that we are in. He did not accept defeat when Christ went to the cross and rose from the dead. Nor is he going to give up until Christ comes again and put him away forever. Our spiritual and Christian values are being attacked every moment of the day. You know, something is really terribly wrong with this picture. You know, we cannot even, we cannot even mention God in our schools or in our workplace today without retribution. It is so sad that we cannot talk about Christ in our schools, but we can talk about sex and promiscuous behavior. Ah, tell me something is not wrong with that. See, just recently, a high school student was suspended just for saying, bless you. What is wrong? What is wrong with this picture? What is wrong with our society? But I tell you what, 
We all have to rebuild integrity and Christian values in our school systems or else we are going to lose our kids. Some of us have already lost them. And rebuilding the integrity and Christian values has to come from our youths. It has to come from us as parents. It has to come from this congregation. And it has to come from the communities around us. You see, the culture that we live in today supports everything but the sanctity of our Christian values. Everything but our Christian values. Society and media to the Great Commission is as far as the East is from the West. It's the truth. Hollywood and media, they're corrupting our, the sanctity of our lives, our souls. You can hardly watch a TV show today without any violence or curses or nudities. Come on. Needless to say, advertisements and commercials. And then, and then we wonder, we wonder why. Why are there so many violence in our homes? Why are there so many violence in our schools? Why are there so many violence in our streets? In our communities? Why? Let us face the truth. We are all living in an era and a time like never before. And it is having a devastating impact in our Christian walk of life. It is nothing but the truth. Here's where the rubber meets the road, so stay with me just a little longer. Now, please don't get me wrong. Technology, the Mac, and science are great. In fact, I make a living through technology. That's what I do. Through the advancements of science and technology, we have been able to find many cures for deadly diseases. Cancer, cardiac diseases, they continue to be very deadly, but at least our survival rate continues to be higher and higher. And our lifespans continue to get longer and longer. But I hate to say this. While we have been able to eradicate deadly diseases and while we have been able to enjoy longer lifespans and healthier lifestyles, we have created a new epidemic that is eating away at the very core of our Christian values. We are creating an epidemic that is eating away at the foundation of our homes. We are creating an epidemic that is breaking down the pillars of our families. We are creating an epidemic that is destroying the foundation of our Christian faith and legacy. Many kids today don't have an idea what a rotary phone is. Do you, any of you remember what a rotary phone is? Or none of them have ever written a letter to grandma or grandpa and take it over to the mailbox and stick it in there and say, hey, you know, two weeks after it arrives. You see, times have changed, and we have gotten a lot more sophisticated. So out goes the rotary phone, and in come mobile devices. We don't even call it cell phone anymore because we do so much more with it. It's mobile devices. You know what I'm talking about. This piece of thing that controls our lives. You know, a random survey, the question was asked, what is the first thing that you touch when you wake up in the morning? Do you know what the number one answer was? What's the first thing that you touch When you wake up in the morning, Dave, it's our mobile devices. 
I looked up the definition of idol in Webster, and it says it's a representation or symbol of an object of worship, broadly a false god. Friends, are we worshiping idols or false gods and we don't even know it? There used to be a time when we wake up in the morning, the first thing that we do is to get on our knees and cry out to God for His grace and His guidance. There used to be a time when the first thing that we do in the morning is to pick up our Bibles and read the Word of God to start our days. What is the first thing that we do now? I got to check. I got to check my Facebook account. I got to check my emails. First thing we go is to our mobile devices. We, we are at a point today that if you want to know something about someone, all you have to do is to check their Facebook account or their Twitter account. Come on. Come on. Let's face it. It's nothing but the truth. You see, the point I'm trying to make here is that God created us so that we can love and we can worship and we can glorify Him and we can love and have a loving relationship with each other. Mobile devices and flat screen TV and media does not have relationships. It destroys relationships. And if relationship was not important to God, instead of creating Adam and Eve in His own image and breathe the breath of life into them, he could have created a few mechanical devices instead. But it does not matter how great an advanced science and technology is, it is dead. It does not have life. It is lifeless. Instead, God wanted us to have a relationship with Him and with each other, and that is why he created us, because he wants us to have, and everyone to have a relationship and partake with him at his table. He compelled us to share the good news of his salvation to the entire world. Not just with you, Dale. Or Ron, not just with you. The entire world. Whether we realize it or not, we are in a spiritual warfare. We live in a culture that is increasingly hostile to our faith. And the devil and those who promote his agenda are relentless in their assaults on our minds and our affections. And we cannot afford to drop our guard. Not for a minute. No, we can't. And if we are prepared, if we are prepared to take on Satan, we got to do something about it. We got to be careful. Don't engage Satan alone. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 says, Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. We have to employ every piece of our spiritual armor. To resist the scheme of the devil, you must take up the full armor of God, not just the belt of truth, uh, but, but also the shoes of his gospel, the breastplate of his righteousness, the shield of faith, the helmet of his salvation, and the sword of his spirit, the word of God. Don't head into battle without them. And you have to go on the offensive. It is just not enough to play defense anymore. Though people without Christ may be seen uh, fulfilled and self-satisfied, the truth is they need to know God's forgiveness. And we have to stop, quit wasting time. You and I are fighting for the souls of the future generation. And the consequences of our lives are too eternal to waste on. See, despite, despite all the chaos in the world today, we have to show the world that we are not just Christians, 
but we are Christ followers through our love and our actions. Let us not lose the opportunity that Christians in South Africa lost when they could have shown the love of Christ to Gandhi. Who knows how many more souls could have been saved today. You see, God is not going to ask us to do something that he has not already given us. As a deacon of this church, I call upon my fellow deacons. I call upon our leaders, our Sunday school teachers, our elders, our youths. If you're simply visiting here today, I call upon you. I call upon this congregation for us to unite and create a new culture that embodies Christ. And let us do God's kingdom's work by passing on the legacy and make nations, uh, uh, disciples of all nations. As, of, as followers and those of who carry the baton in our hands and ready to, be, to pass it on to the next runner, we have to be authentic. We have to be authentic. You've heard this before, garbage in, garbage out. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 12, the absolutes, of being a Christ follower. Romans 12, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your body as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but transform by renewing of your mind. Then, you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Without a question, we have an obligation to carry out God's kingdom's work and to carry on the legacy of our faith and to be his hands and his feet right here on earth. Whatever it is, the journey begins right here at Downtown Baptist for many of us. See, God, God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. Not everyone is going to be a Billy Graham, but we can all be a Mother Teresa. God does not call the qualified. He qualifies the call. I like what C.S. Lewis said. So look at yourself and you will find loneliness and despair. Look for Christ and you will find him and everything else. Father God, as we leave this place here today, let us be reminded why you have created, why you have created us and the reasons of our existence. Convict us where we need to be convicted and help us to rise up to your calling and make disciples of all nations. Let us be your hands and your feet and let us preach the gospel only use words if it is necessary. Let us make a clean pass of the baton and carry on the legacy of our faith until that day when you shall come again. And in your precious name we pray. Amen.